I want to start out by asking one question that I'm going to ask all four of you, and it's the only time I'm, I want to go down the, the row here. But if you guys would each introduce yourself and tell everybody who you're with, but I want you to tell us what we mean by stable coin or stability. How do we define it? So let's start with you, Nevin. Hi, everyone. I'm Nevin. Um, I'm a co-founder of a stable coin called Reserve. And uh, the thing that we mean by stable or stability in stable coin is essentially the main maintenance of purchasing power. So if you can purchase X amount of goods or services today with your money, can you also purchase X amount tomorrow or in a year or in 10 years? That's the basic concept that we're using. Hey, Rafael. I'm Raphael. I'm one of the co-founders of Trust Token, and we are the makers of True USD, which is one of the largest stable coins in the world today. We've got about $230 million market cap. Um, stable coins are price-stable crypto assets. We actually think of the product that we've created as more as tokenized fiat currencies rather than stable coins, because you know, currencies have varying degrees of stability. Um, but we recently launched several new products, including True British Pound, True Australian Dollar, true Canadian dollar, and we've got true Euro and true Hong Kong dollar coming up. And each of these products is backed one for one with the corresponding fiat currency. So if you want to learn more about any of our products or purchase and redeem them, you can go to trusttoken.com. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich. I'm co-founder of a company called Paxos. Uh, we've issued a stable coin called Pax. And uh, you know, we think what makes it really stable is that Pax is the only fully regulated and liquid stable coin in the market right now. Uh, not only is Paxos Trust a regulated uh, trust company in New York, uh, it is Paxos, the product Pax, is also specifically approved by the New York Department of Financial Services. That means that every dollar we have backing Pax is verified by the same regulators that regulate top banks in the US. Uh, and we also believe that what's important is that there's zero friction in cash coming out. So uh, we have processed, uh, from what we can see externally, more redemptions of people getting cash from their stablecoin than any other stablecoin we're aware of. Uh, I'm Alex Lipton. I'm a co-founder and chief technical officer of a, a startup called Sila Money and also a Connection Science Fellow at MIT. And uh, uh, we are providing uh, uh, means uh, we, we are providing uh, tokenized medium of exchange uh, with the aim of serving mostly at the moment um, new fintech companies and so on. So our idea is to build a fully programmable money, so to speak, or better to say tokenized medium of exchange. Again, I want to be careful not to offend our lawyers. And uh, uh, mm, we uh, think that only by seamlessly uh, m mashing together the existing uh, banking system and the blockchain in a regulatory compliant fashion, you can achieve its true potential. And that's what uh, Sila is aiming at doing. Do we, do we need to have a single definition of stablecoin or stability? Does that matter for this ecosystem to move forward? Or because people debate all the time what we mean by stablecoin. And so do we have to get to a common understanding, or does it make a difference? Uh, Raphael, you're shaking your head. What do you think? I, I'd say it doesn't make a difference. Okay. In fact, I think the term stablecoin may actually go out of vogue, because at the end of the day, the reason why people buy our products is not because uh, they're just stable. It's because they, they want exposure to those specific fiat currencies or those specific underlying assets. So people buy true USD, true British pound, and so on because they want to hold the US dollar, they want to hold the British pound, they want to have that product. And I think that the line of what makes something stable versus unstable is very fuzzy. So we, we think about it as, uh, um, you, know, and we, you know, we view that different stable coins have different users out there, so the definition can change. Uh, but I think what we, what we view our stable coin as is not a gateway to uh, exposure to various currencies, but more the most convenient way to trade something else. So we just want to be the base currency of that. So the most convenient way to get in and out of crypto. And potentially in the future, the most convenient way and legally get in and out of various other tokenized assets. Well, as far as us, uh, we view uh, stable coin as means uh, to an end rather than an end in, its, in and in itself. Uh, so our idea is that you should be able to actually um, use uh, the blockchain 
uh, as a medium to transfer value from point A to point B. And again, I mean, w with all this regulatory compliant uh, discussion, I'm sorry, with all this stable coin discussion, it's very important to emphasize that it has to be, in the end of the day, regulatory compliant, because if it is not, regardless of what you try to do, sooner or later, they will come and knock on your door and uh, close the shop. So basically, that's very important, but the, 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 the true value in my mind is that you can do something better or something which you couldn't do before uh, by means of this particular product. And we can discuss a uh, taxonomy of this uh, stable coin if this comes to. So but you, you talk about doing something better and you know, the, the title for this panel is end of volatility. And so is, is that, I guess two questions, is that the ultimate goal for stable coins and can we get there with stable coins? Well, so as, as Raf was talking about, it's like some people are buying tokenized fiat currencies not because they want stability, but because they think that that currency is going to appreciate relative to other currencies, which is kind of why they would want exposure to an asset class. Um, I, think that's, I think that's true. And there's a bunch of people who are doing that. I think that there are also a lot of people in the world who aren't in that investing mindset, who just are looking to preserve purchasing power and have a useful means of exchange. Um, and so I think that... Um, so yeah, so I think that fr from that mindset, you do want the end of volatility. You want to be able to stop thinking about volatility of your store value of whatever your money is um, and just assume that it's going to be the same forever. Um, and so I think that's kind of a different user population set. Um, and so from that perspective, yeah, the end of volatility would be good so, for those so people. So what is it then that you guys can do different than, for example, Bitcoin? Because one of the challenges we've seen, and Bitcoin thankfully is up now, but we've seen it go like this. So what is it that you can do differently that potentially addresses that issue or solves it or makes it go away? Well, well the issue with Bitcoin, um, from my perspective, the reason why it will never really be a cryptocurrency um, is because the monetary policy is a bit too simple, right? So if, you, if you're trying to balance supply and demand and your supply is fixed and your demand is changing, then you're never really gonna have a stable currency. So I think the fundamental core idea, from my perspective, of creating um, you know, a stable coin or a cryptocurrency that just preserves purchasing power is to somehow balance supply and demand in the way that sort of the dollar is managed or, or something like that um, by pegging to the dollar, et cetera, in order to, to have something that really works as a form of money. That's the basic mission from my perspective. I actually don't think that there's a large market for just like a super stable coin. Like imagine, for example, if we launched a product which was, which was perfectly pegged to a basket of consumer goods, right? Which is, in many, in many worlds, the definition of stability. So if we had this token, you know, one basket token, like, do, do I actually think this would be a good product and people would trade it and buy it? I don't think so. And the reason is because, you know, people don't do commerce in baskets of goods. People don't think that way. They don't think like, oh, I'm gonna go buy this, a Bitcoin for 83 baskets of goods. No, you think, I'm gonna go buy a Bitcoin for 7,000 US dollars. And so people don't think that, people, people don't think in those terms, people don't do transactions or commerce in those terms, no one works in those. And so I actually think if we launched a coin like that, I think we would see very limited adoption. So Raphael, but, what's, what's your solution then? Um, my, our solution is to tokenize fiat assets that people, or any kinds of assets that people know and trust and want to buy and hold, like the US dollar. People want to hold it, they want to buy it, they think in terms of US dollars, they do commerce in US dollars. So it's way easier to get people to adopt a tokenized US dollar as a means of transaction, or, you know, a means of trade, as opposed to just a tokenized basket of goods, which I think, I think would have limited adoption. Right. I, I think people don't want to change their behavior and their mindset, which is very important. Uh, and in the way we think about it is that our entire industry uh, is a series of various instruments. So if I have it in my wallet, I own it, and it's, it's, it's out there in the space. It's all a bunch of various instruments, and there's no connection between that various instrument world and the current world we live in, which has banks and we pay for things in dollars. And so you know, that's why we believe that a uh, stable coin needs to connect these two worlds. And I think having a stable coin that you can be sure is regulated and has money coming in and out ensures that we can connect this amazing space with a whole bunch of various instruments uh, to the real world where you actually can link an instrument to a dollar in a bank account. And then that allows us to actually you know, move wealth created, move everything else from this very instrument world to the real world or, or the, the physical world where we can actually use and spend this. Okay, but yeah. are we then, are, are we just talking about taking a, a real world asset like a dollar 
and just digitizing it and creating well, a digital representation, or is it something more different? Well, in my mind, uh, you know, when the internet was created, uh, you know, there were missing um, conspicuous uh, absences there. There was uh, missing specification for identity and missing specification for money. And as a matter of fact, the two are actually intricately connected in the first place. So what I think is needed is to, and for the kind of for decades afterwards, it was not tec technically feasible to actually do anything about it. But now with the advent of um, blockchain and this way of thinking, we actually can uh, imagine that at least parts of this uh, gaping holes can be filled and in particular the protocol for money can be filled as long as you build um, you know something uh, which is related as the previous panelists said correctly uh, to the uh, underlying world uh, at the risk of making you know kind of <laughs> you know myself unpopular in this meeting I have to say no, that no, bi do it. Bitcoin Bitcoin is not money and I mean never will be even though I have been changing my mind, not, not with the <laughs> growth of Bitcoin of the la last six weeks, but generally I start to think that maybe it actually can play the role of treasure. And so like in the Middle Ages. And in fact, uh, um, my particular kind of uh, change in heart happened when the, with the recent hack of an exchange um, where 7,000 Bitcoins were stolen, but kind of it was figured out that it is impossible to revert, which is a very, very good thing. Not of obviously for those people whose Bitcoin was stolen, but in general for the community, you know. I think that uh, when um, Ethereum was rolled back a couple of years back, okay, maybe it was growing pangs, but it was a disastrous decision by itself. Anyway, so what I think is necessary is something which is linked to the real assets, and it can be done at different levels. So, for example, at Sila, right now we are considering fiat currencies, but at MIT we're thinking a little broader and thinking about what we call digital trade coin, uh, which is backed by a variety of assets and can facilitate <coughs> trade within the whole geographical region. So, for example, Belt and Road and stuff like that. Well, I, th I think that's still a good segue because um, that, that tells us already that even though we start out, the first question was, what do we mean by stable stability? There are a lot of different ways to get there. So what are the different ways that the market is trying to create stable coins? And, you know, I'd love to hear your views on who's, you know, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. You know, but what are we seeing out there right now? Well, so we're seeing the three main types of stable coins. There's fiat-backed stable coins, like Paxos and TrueUSD. There's crypto-backed stable coins like DAI, and then there's ones that are sort of you know, algorithmically backed and aren't holding any specific asset in reserve. And um, from our perspective, it seems like there's, there's a convergence of the whole market on fiat-backed stable coins as opposed to the other approaches. I think that there's a very good reason why we haven't seen any coins achieve a large market cap or large trading volumes from the other two categories of, of uh, crypto-backed or al algorithmically backed. Um, and the main reason is people want to be able to, they want something that's simple and they understand, and also they want to be able to move fiat currencies easily in and out of the coin. So I want others to, to chime in as well, but let me ask you just a very quick follow-up question. When you, when you, for example, say fiat back, are we literally talking about somebody being able to take your coin and come to you and say, here's my coin, give me a dollar? Yes, that's exactly okay. right. And that's what you can do today with Paxos or TrueUSD. Right. Well, I mean, in my mind, there are at least four ways of creating a stable coin, or at least four attempted ways of creating a stable coin. One, and the best, by the way, is uh, to back it with fiat, or if you think a little broader, perhaps fiat per se is not an ideal medium to back your coin, but something r linked to it uh, in a somewhat uh, more ingenious way, maybe a better version of doing it, but for the sake of this conf uh, co co discussion, shall we say fiat. The second is attempt to build a stable coin partially back this with fiat. That is kind of bound to complete failure and very quickly, and you know, kind of all these attempts Wh to why, why is that a failure? Well, because if you partially stabil uh, stabilize your coin with fiat, you know, sooner or later people will come and say, give me 
you know, <laughs> my coins and you will just do not have the enough collateral. And all these attempts in the past to, to stabilize things, partially collateralized kind of, they all ended in disaster. And we don't need to think about current situation, right? So if we think about the French Revolution, they tried to issue assignats because there was no hard uh, mm, cash. And, you know, they had all the apparatus of coercion up to and including uh, Madame Guillotine, and yet they never managed to stabilize uh, uh, assignats and they lost 96% of their value in two years, right? Did, so did anybody predict, by the way, that we're going to be talking about guillotine and the French Revolution this morning? <laughs> That's why this panel is so important. Right. Well, I mean, but, 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 no, but let me ask yeah. you, are, right. are, you say, are you saying though that if we create a stable coin that you literally cannot surrender in exchange for the underlying fiat that it's not a stable coin that can work? Sure. Does it have to be exchangeable? Yeah, absolutely, because otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't mean, I mean, in the ideal world, you don't want to see these exchanges. What you do want to see uh, coins circulating freely and incidentally, the way they were designed to kind of in the mind of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto and whoever created Bitcoin, right? So it's a free exchange from one public address to the other. That's not how the system works right now. If you want to, you, you know, in, in reality, if you're getting interest in Bitcoin, your first and foremost problem is actually to get Bitcoin, and for that you have to go to a centralized source. So that might be kind of the initial stage of departure for a stable coin as well, but ideally, if people know that it is truly exchangeable and there is a proof that it is exchangeable, well, and you can exchange it's exchangeable it. Exchangeable for, for other assets. Well, but, I, mean, but I mean, as I said. I'm talking you know, about, can you, do you have to be able to surrender it for the underlying fiat? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a definition of stability ability, right? So in, in a sense, uh, for example, if you are a US-based uh, individual, for you, euro is not stable. And likewise, if you're based in euro, dollar is not stable. So you need to understand what you really mean by stability. But, you know, the, 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 the ultimate thing is to, to be able to exchange it to, to whatever is promised as the underlying. Rich, so, you, you agree or disagree? So, well, I just want to take the discussion, you know, step back. I think the disagreement here is, for us, we think that stable means, you know, it's one dollar. You come to us, we're going to give you one dollar, and you actually want that one dollar. But I think, you know, um, other types of stable coins, you know, the non-fiat backed ones, believe that one dollar has to retain its purchasing power one dollar, right? So when they want something back, they actually don't want one dollar back. They want a guarantee of their purchasing power. So what we're trying to solve for is, if you go to Starbucks and it's a five dollar cup of coffee, and you pay with with, with trust token or PAX, you're just gonna pay $5. But then what other people may be trying to solve for is the value of this coffee relative to the value of all other assets in the world, the value of the true economic underlining issues or whatever of your currency, your background, your whatever, right? So that becomes a very complicated equation. Uh, and if you try to solve for that, what would most likely happen is that you would not have that $5 to pay for a cup of coffee and definitely Starbucks would not accept, you know, whatever calculation of this value. So do we believe that in the future, uh, you know, what, what you're saying makes a lot of sense? You know, I hope so. I mean, we haven't had it in human history that there has been anything that retains value and purchasing power over time. So if it does happen with crypto, great, but we've never seen that in human history. And oh. so we just believe that if you just can pay that $5, that's a huge improvement. And you know, hopefully somebody else, you know, hopefully yourself, will come up with a way where you don't get five dollars, but you just get purchasing power based on some set of. So, so Nevin, does that mean? Does that mean, for example, that there's no role for algorithmic stable coins, or, or that the only real stable coin is something that's backed literally one for one by fiat? So um, let me let me put it this way: if you're trying to figure out which stablecoin design is going to work to scale up to like a hundred billion or a trillion dollars worth of the stablecoin and actually become a big currency that's in wide use. The way we think about it is that um, it has to have three features. So the first one is obvious, the thing has to be stable in some regard. We can however, debate, however we we can debate the definition, but like it has to be right. like stable in whatever way that the people care about, okay? Number two is it has to be scalable. And when I say scalable here, I don't mean the thing that we normally mean by scalable in the crypto world. I'm not talking about the transaction throughput um, or the speed. That's also important. But really what I'm talking about is 
the number of units in circulation of that stablecoin has to be able to grow smoothly as demand for that stablecoin grows, right? And some designs actually don't allow that if you look at the details. What so about fiat-backed stablecoins? Do they fulfill that property? Perfectly, yeah. So fiat-backed stablecoins are, are excellent on stability and scalability. I think that they're like the best for that right now. Um, and then the third is uh, basically it has to be that the thing can't be turned off in the way that Bitcoin can't be turned off. And I think this is more of a controversial view because I think we haven't really seen this play out yet. So my view is that if stable coins get to 100 billion or a trillion or beyond, um, they're gonna be very, very disruptive. And why is that? It's because they permit the anonymous transmission of money. And, and in the way that Bitcoin is not exactly used as money, these things really can be. And so I think that we should foresee like a lot of controversy over these sorts of things if they get to be that big. And so that's why I think it's so important that the thing has to be Bitcoin-like in the fact that you can't shut it off because if you can, I think that they will be shut off. And so I think the thing that we should all be hunting for carefully is something that is stable, scalable, and uh, sort of you know, resistant to, to attacks, I would say, or, or censorship resistant, um, or, or what have you. Where really, you know, the, the main way of doing that currently in the crypto space, the idea is to be decentralized. And decentralization is kind of a buzzword. A lot of things don't really need to be decentralized. I think a stable coin that gets enormous, that actually is like really changing the way the financial world works, does actually have to be decentralized. And so I think right now the fiat-backed approaches that you guys are doing are killing it. I think that they're the best. And then the question from my perspective is, can you get to a point where those are like a dominant currency in the world and have them not be turned well, off. Let, let and, me and, so, and so one, just one word being really fast is that I do think that having that underlying asset backing is the right way to do it. And so from my perspective, the puzzle that I'm trying to solve and I think others should try to solve is how do we have something that's asset backed and decentralized? People sort of think that those can't go together. I think that they maybe can go together. Um, and we have a whole complicated thesis on that. Check out reserve.org. I won't plug the project right now, but, but so that's the way that I'm thinking about it. So right. you need something with all but, three but of guys, I, I am confused though about something fundamental because <laughs> if, if we're coalescing around the concept that for there to really be a stable coin, it, it is fiat backed, why can't central banks simply digitize their own currency and immediately put you out of business tomorrow? They why, absolutely, why do we need they, they can in principle. Yes. But, uh, you know, first of all, these are conservative institutions which might not want to do it uh, for the longest of time. And I had an opportunity to discuss it with uh, various central bankers over the years, and um, they're not really ready for that. And the other thing is that uh, there are different ways of doing it. And so one would be for everyone, literally for everyone, to have an account with a central bank. Right, so that is uh, a possibility, but it's a very remote one because, uh, first of all, <laughs> surprisingly, people think that central banks are omnipotent and so on, and they create money, and, uh, but it is not true. I mean, they neither omnipotent nor they do create money, but uh, the point is that they also technically are not ready because, uh, for example, I used to work for a financial institution in, in the a, a very big one, admittedly. So we had maybe like uh, 250,000 people working in the organization, and the Fed probably has maybe 20,000 people. They're just not ready to open uh, the kind of book, so they well, cannot do But they, do they this. certainly have more employees than all of you guys have collectively. Yeah, right that's now. for sure. And, no, and that, so, <laughs> that's for sure, and that's and, the idea, so to speak, right? I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, so, 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 so I was just gonna add real quick to yeah. that. That the, uh, the IMF, I believe, was the IMF published a study of the number of central banks right. considering uh, um, uh, uh, fiat-backed stablecoins, and the number was actually quite high. I believe it was about twenty-five or twenty-five or something like that. And you know, they listed them in various stages of consideration. And I believe, you know, I've been in this industry since two thousand twelve. I believe the first ones that I read of was probably. Canada, 2013, possibly? Well, but it, it moved nowhere. Well, I mean, they it did moved, write, so I, 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 I know, know the guys who wrote the and, uh, this white paper and so on, but they were right. very proud of themselves. And, and, but I mean, nothing came out of it. Right, so I mean, you know, you know, we, you know, we, you know, we do believe that, you know, that we view not so much as a massive competitor, but really the killer app that makes this a lot more mainstream. More, so, so more flexible than a central bank? You know, uh, more flexible, something that, 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 that is an acknowledgement that this thing could really become mainstream. If a central bank, if a central bank feels that fiat-backed 
stable coins on the blockchain is the way that governments should be ran, then I think this industry changes entirely. So whether or not you know, stable coins or whatever, I mean, it's a huge game changer, right? So we don't view them as, oh no, please don't do that. Uh, we would love to work with them if, if we had a chance to. We'd love to include them. We'd love to interchange between them. I mean, you know, there, there are so many stable coins out there you know, right now. If one had the legitimacy of a national government, I think it, it changes everything. So, um, so I, I think that it absolutely makes sense for central banks to do this. I think that they will. Um, and the question I ask the audience is, if central banks make uh, blockchain-based digital representations of their currency, will they announce, allow people to transmit that anonymously? Or will they do something to try to track who's holding the currency? And I think the, if you look at the whole banking system, I think the answer is they'll do something to try to track who's holding the currency. And so then the question is just, you know, well, they are the central banks, so maybe that will win anyway. Maybe they can enforce that upon the world. But the way we think about it, if you look at all of the biggest businesses and all of the wealthiest people, people who have sort of real owned power in the world, if you give them the choice of something that is, you know, sort of the same amount of stability, one allows them to have, be more private and one that doesn't, which one are they going to choose? Well, I, I don't know. It depends on the regulatory regime and how costly it is to take the privacy, but people generally want privacy. And so I think that's, that's the question that I think is relevant if you're trying to figure out, are the central bank digital currencies going to win, or is it going to be something else that's a bit more Bitcoin-like? So Raphael, if we look out one or two years, uh, where, where, do we, where will we be? Are, are, are you guys replacing Bitcoin? Are you in a completely different part of the crypto space than Bitcoin? Is there going to be a number of stable coins out there, or do we see one or two that win? You know, I know, when we try to predict in this world, that's always a non-starter, but, but notwithstanding that, since I get to ask the question, what does it look like, like, two years out? Yeah, so I think, I think two years out, we're going to see a lot more tokenized assets. I think there's, you know, for any given asset, like U.S. dollars or British pounds, I think there's only going to be a handful of actual large coins, because... Um, and that's, that's what we've including seen Including Bitcoin or not including Bitcoin? Oh, I think Bitcoin will totally continue to exist. And I think actually everything that's going on with stable coins is very bullish for Bitcoin and very bullish for the whole space in general. Because you know, one of the key things that we're doing by building out different tokenized fiat currencies is we're making it possible for anyone to easily on-ramp every major fiat currency. You can go to our app today and you can on-ramp four different fiat currencies and we're launching several more soon. And I think we're going to see it. We're going to see assets beyond tokenized currencies, tokenized commodities, tokenized securities, tokenized real estate down the road. I think that the market is not ready for some of those products yet, which is why we're focusing on currencies at the moment. So, so how, how do really stable good. coins help those other tokenized assets move forward? Um, in a couple of ways. I mean, first they get people, first of all, they act as a gateway for money to come in and out of crypto. They're very useful for trading if you want to trade other assets or you know, pay out dividends or things like that. Um, and they also get people comfortable with the idea of like, okay, so this is, this is a, you know, a tokenized U.S. dollar, and it's backed by a real dollar in a real U.S. bank account. What, do, what stops a Facebook, because you know, they've been in the press a lot lately, from creating their own stable coin as opposed to adopting one of yours? I mean, it's very possible. I think that they probably will create their own stable coin. And does that put you guys out of, out of business, or is there space for, for both those proprietary stable coins and the kind that you guys are creating? Um, I, I'd say there's space for, bo for both. I think that you know, we already have a very large ecosystem of exchanges and crypto, other crypto companies and a lot of applications that are starting to use TrueUSD now outside of crypto. And so I'm, I think that you know, Facebook could, develop, could start to build out its own ecosystem, but I, I don't think it's going to be a huge threat to many of the ecosystems that we're already developing. Okay, so, so Raphael we'll, described his view of the future. You, you guys agree, disagree? Is that, is that, is that how we, uh, where we are going to be two years from now? Or? Uh, real quick on the Facebook question, I think it's, it's, it's sort of the same dynamics as with central banks. Um, I think the, the Facebook coin will be a stable coin. I think it'll be awesome. It'll be distributed to billions of people, but it'll be very similar to WeChat Pay or PayPal in terms of the KYC regime. And so I think it will just be a, a different sort of product than the existing fiat backed stable coins. I think for the Facebook, yeah. uh, the, the Facebook, Facebook question, I mean, uh, for us, uh, Praxis Trust Company, uh, we are happy to work with anybody who wants to create and tokenize assets. And you know, what we want to help them with is that we can help them create their own stable coin, tokenize anything else, have it in our trust company, and help them do it in a legal fashion so that they can send it, use it, 
uh, and have it uh, more regulated and safer for the long run. So when, if a stable coin or any other company with significant reserves were to say, hey, we'll love to create something like PAX, but for us, uh, we would love to help you out. So this kills me, but we've hit our time, so I have to end this now. So let me, if, if you feel now that you can all go out to bar tonight and explain to your friend what stable coins are, please give this panel a round of applause. Yeah.